10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Comenzamos. Uh, pieces of nuance in that, and it certainly does take a step beyond the spectator piece to clarify. So I think, as you said, you were going to say what you think, and I think we've had a chance to hear it. Before I drill down on that one, let me just turn to Asia, since the time is short. Uh, you've been uh, involved in the whole question of China and its role in the world, including its relation with the U.S., uh, since you and Nixon went to China to open relations with China now a half century ago. Uh, when uh, that began, if uh, one of the clear irreconcilable differences among the parties at that time were the views about Taiwan. Uh, but in the Shanghai communique and in the framework of strategic ambiguity that you and Zhou and Lai and company wove, uh, irreconcilables didn't turn out to be unmanageables. And somehow the five decades since then have actually seen better increases in the lives and well-being of people on both sides of the straits than in any equivalent period in their history. So uh, on the other hand, uh, this situation is heating up where you can see some political impulses in the U.S. Uh, even calling for recognition of Taiwan as an independent country, something that you've said and that I have written as well, uh, I cannot imagine any Chinese leader abiding. Uh, so uh, what about the Asian front and also from a historical perspective? When the uh, when President Nixon began to move together with Chairman Mao towards progress in the American Chinese relationship, there had been 162 negotiations about Taiwan in Warsaw, which ended very quickly on each occasion, because each side put forward the proposals that the other side would not accept. We began the process because we were convinced that the American people should be given a vision of peace that was not defined by the Vietnam War but that showed prospects of constructive relationships developing even among societies that had ideologically substantial differences. China felt itself at the same time under pressure from Russia and considered it to its own advantage to open a dialogue with the United States. For five decades, this process operated effectively. The issue of Taiwan was put under arrangements under which the Taiwan to develop economically, politically, without the affirmation by the United States of a separate China and the contribution that the United States made to the process was its affirmation that it understood the 
the, the Chinese view on one China and that it would not challenge it. Its process has been under pressure in each year's outside. In recent weeks, the presidents of China and the United States have met to arrest the movement towards conflict and begun and created a basis for a dialogue. And I am delighted to see that my friend of two decades, Leo, has expressed a vision at this meeting, which outlines ways by which this process can be implemented. What this process needs, above all, is a deep conviction on both sides that it is not simply a tactical move, but a necessity for our period when the two technologically most advanced countries with capacities in artificial intelligence and nuclear destructiveness are engaged in a confrontation, in a military confrontation. The structure and stability and ultimately the survival of mankind is threatened. We each side should not look at these negotiations as a means of building on its assumed advantages over the other and in preparing for an expected showdown. In the first phase, such a goal is probably is not achievable. In the first phase, a number of specific steps need to be taken on the more limited and concrete issues that confront us. And I notice with great pleasure that the Chinese side has lifted its insistence that every issue had to be negotiated simultaneously and that the um, United States has reciprocated by its own willingness to engage in specific steps like the conversations that will take place here between the Ho and Secretary Yellen and negotiations that are going on between uh, the principles in the the climate issue uh, in time each side needs to consider for itself how the threat to human survival of the destructiveness of weapons coupled with making them uh, most conscious in their application can be dealt with. This is a, that seems 
far from immediate negotiations, but it needs to be conducted first within each side and then between the two sides. If that can be achieved, we can live in a world of growing prosperity as has been the case in recent decades without the threat of a kind of military action that can devastate humanity. The two countries will, of course, not talk about a bilateral domination of the world. The two countries have their allies and have their cultural preferences. But they need to do something that has never yet happened, a way of harmonizing the destiny of mankind in developing its non-destructive capabilities for the sake of peace, progress, and humanity. That vision can be put before us, but only if the leaders of both countries produce the conviction in their societies that it is not necessary and not act on the belief that they can find a way to destroy the others by the other's inadvertence. Yet the goals are clear. How to achieve it is a challenge to the domestic politics of each of our countries. But it is necessary and therefore should be pursued. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. It's so, Henry, we've got about two and a half minutes left. Uh, so I saw Luha today. He sends you the warmest regards. I said uh, you had told me to tell him that uh, you were coming to China soon. He said sooner rather than later. I said maybe April, you had told me. But he said they'll welcome you with, with open arms. So uh, that's his best regards. And he gave an excellent presentation at the Davos uh, session, as you mentioned earlier today. But with uh, one minute and 45 seconds left, if you were thinking about Taiwan again the way you thought about it 50 years ago, any clues? No, I think it would be best if both sides prevented conduct that the other would interpret as an imminent showdown. That is, that China should restrain its military buildup and the United States should pre avoid acting as if it was heading for a two-China solution under the guise of one China, uh, of one China principles. And in the interim, while they are reflecting about how to implement this, uh, if both sides could cool and avoid threatening language vis-a-vis -vis the other, it might create, it would create conditions in which a dialogue can be pursued. Well, thank you very much. So I'm sorry that our time has given up, given out for today, but uh, for 99 years young, 
uh, your mind is as sharp as ever. And I would say we're looking forward to the centennial and beyond. So let's say thank you very much to him. That concludes our session.